Hello and welcome to Climate Conversations. This month we're talking about climate and nature and how biodiversity is really important to the natural environment. But also we're going to be focusing in on local species and how they're having to adapt to our changing environment. The Wildlife Trust do really important work here in the UK, helping to preserve our natural environment. And I'm very pleased to welcome along to Climate Conversations this month, uh, Nigel Dorr, who is Head of Research and Science at the Wildlife Trust. Um, first up, welcome along. Thanks for joining me. What's, Hello. Uh, what is the mission of the Wildlife Trust, would you say? Where are you based? Well, we have three things. Um, <clears throat> we're here to bring nature back to help nature to recover. Um, and we do that partly by uh, empowering people to get on and do it themselves. That's a very big part of what we do. And um, one of the reasons why somebody might do that is because they recognise the value of wildlife and nature in solving problems they have, health, well-being, dealing with climate change, flood, flood risk management, all of those sorts of things. And those are the, really the things that motivate us. Um, we're a federation of uh, local organisations that, that work all over the UK and in, in the Crown Dependencies on the Isle of Man and, and the Isle of Albany. The wildlife just generally, I guess, you've had to adapt uh, as our climate is changing. How, how would you say that has changed in the past few years? I've been around the Wildlife Trust for 30-something years and I do remember having conversations with you know, our local members and people, trying to encourage them to think about climate change, you know, 25, 30 years yeah. ago. It's been on our agenda for a very long time. Um, and since 2000, we've been trying to build landscapes that are more resilient to climate change and, and better for wildlife and, you know, so that they can, you know, uh, wildlife can cope with the changes that are coming. Um, but it's certainly accelerated as with everyone else in, in, in recent years. And um, you've been working quite closely with the Met Office on a particular project over the past year or so. Do you want to tell yeah, us a well, well, bit more about that? This is a great opportunity to bring together some you know, people in the Met Office who want to do good stuff that's going to help wildlife and people in wildlife trusts that have things they need to understand about right. the likely implications of climate for the wildlife that we're trying to conserve. And um, who were involved? Um, it's a whole mix of pe people. I mean, on, on our side of it, there are res nature reserve managers, people in the Wildlife Trust who've got, um, well, questions that they want answers to. Um, and equally in the Met Office, I mean, I, I gather there are, there are different people, some scientists, climate scientists, people dealing with data, people dealing with communications, all sorts of different people who thought they would have something to offer to the project. And how did that work, the relationship between the Met Office and the Wildlife Trust? Um, well, we set up online groups of people to discuss what, what were the questions that were answerable so we could understand each other better, people from the Met Office, people from the Wildlife Trust. Once we decided what the questions were, then um, the Wildlife Trust went away to collect our data about butterflies or, or whatever it was and then brought those and then the climate data came from the Met Office people. And then w over the months we would each go away and do our bit of um, discussing how the project was going, bring them back to, to some meetings and, 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 and the guys from the Met Office here would um, come along to show what the latest iteration of the analysis was doing and, and gradually work towards um, insights and conclusions. Can you give us some specific examples? Well, there are loads to choose from but off the top of my head. Um, first one, um, we constantly talk about species that we've lost from different yeah. parts of the country and plants in particular. Last year there was you know, plants disappearing all over the place, we would like to introduce them. But if the climate's changing, you need to know where you can reintroduce them, where the climate that they want to live in is still going to be there. So we looked at um, at Eau Claire and brilliant, modelled out exactly where the climate envelope that it, it likes to live in is going to, how that's going to change over the next 50 years. So that's one good one. Yeah. Um, uh, similarly, one of the problems climate change brings is um, invasive species, you know, that, that, that are t typically like to live in conditions that we didn't have here. Well, um, the Pacific oyster is one of those, right. where it was used in fish farms, produced food. General theory was that it wouldn't reproduce in Britain because the water was too cold, and, but of course it's warming up. So uh, the Ulster Wildlife 
also while I've just, in the Kent world, I've just wanted to know how's that going to change in future as the ocean temperature changes. So with that, put that problem to, to your guys and we've come up with a really good, good um, set of answers about how that will all change. Actually, I think we can show a clip now that highlights the problem you're talking about there with these non-native species, particularly the oysters. This is the Pacific oyster. Quite a bit larger than, than our uh, European flat oyster. Uh, the problem is that um, with rising sea temperatures and climate change, these oysters will become even more prolific and the densities will be high to, to a degree whereby they'll create a monoculture and smother the habitat that is already there and there's a real fear that we could lose our native oysters and, and some of the priority marine features that we have in Strangford Lock if these oysters here get a grip. Nigel, what do you think are the long-term benefits of this collaboration to the Wildlife Trust? I mean, I'm head of research and science, so I and the Wildlife Trust generally believe wholeheartedly in um, basing everything we do on good evidence and understanding. You know, the better you understand something, the better you can deal with it. And there is so much to do with the relationship between climate and the natural world that we kind of understand, but we don't understand it well enough that anything we get out of these gives us a bit more ins in insight and it will allow us to put our projects in the right places. It will allow us to plant, plant, them, you know, plant out those um, uh, wildflowers that we're trying to keep alive in the right places. Mm -hmm. A really important part of all of this is the way you communicate it. Mm -hmm. And um, so the communications guys here at the Met Office um, ran a project with us to look at well how would a typical wildlife trust on one of its nature reserves um, communicate the relationship between that nature reserve and the climate and you know talk about well what sort of amounts of carbon dioxide are being absorbed into that nature reserve because the plants are growing um, how are the plants um, changing and what are the threats that they're facing what contributions that re reserve make to uh, managing flood risk as it increases and so on. So that we produce some great communications materials. What would you say is the single biggest threat to nature from climate change? Well, it's obviously something to do with temperature, but it's really the interaction between water and temperature. Okay. So, so a lot of our people are out there looking after wild and natural places around the country are telling us that um, their biggest concern is drought because wildlife really does get hit by drought, whether it's plants, invertebrates, mammals, birds, whatever it is. Um, and that, um, yeah, flooding affects some things, fine, that's bad, but anyway, drought is the thing that I think we're most concerned about. One of the Met Office scientists heavily involved in this project is Dr. Debbie Hemming. She's been looking at the impact of climate change on the UK's native tree species, and Claire Nazir caught up with her. Dr. Debbie Hemming, first of all, let's talk about this pathogen that you've been tracking. How did you track it? What evidence was there? And what happened to a particular species of tree, which meant that it pretty much died back significantly in the UK? So I think the, the, the pathogen you, you mean is, um, it's a fungus-like organism. It's called Phytophthora ramorum. Um, quite a quite a tongue twister and it was first discovered in the UK in 2002 in Scotland um, we've been looking at the how favorable the climate is for the survival and spread of Phytophthora ramorum um, and we've been mapping this at one kilometer resolution across the UK so since 2002 it's spread across the whole of the UK and although it damages a wide range of different tree and shrub, shrub species, it, it really favours our larch trees, which is about 5% of the woodland in, in the UK. Um, and it, it's damaged or killed most of, most of the areas of larch trees across the UK now. What does this Phytophthora look like? Yeah, it's microscopic. You can't, you can't see the little... Um, uh, fungus-like organism with your naked eye, but under under a microscope, it's a tiny little lobe 
and um, filaments come out of that lobe and it, it spreads very rapidly um, within a tree or within a plant. So it enters within the leaves. It can, it's destructive to the cell walls of, of the plant and then it can spread through the cavities and the, the tubes within, within the plant and it can block um, those up. So um, water and nutrients are not able to then circulate around the tree or the plant and that's how, that's how it kills the plant. What part of the UK is most likely to see this type of pathogen thrive? Um, it's certainly more west where it's associated with wetter conditions. So down the west coast, southwest Scotland, particularly where it's still mild and moderate um, temperatures and very wet. Um, likewise, Wales, southwest England, Northern Ireland. Um, yeah, these are all areas where it's it's basically really favourable for many months of, of the year in, in the UK. So this phytophthora, how is it controlled and managed? Because we're now talking in October 2024, we've had 15 months of wet weather and record breaking rain and not particularly cold as well. So obviously this pathogen can really thrive under these types of environments. Yes, yes, and, and this last summer has been a, a, a really um, good year for Phytophthora. Um, so the way it's managed uh, now is our forestry authorities um, identify trees and woodlands uh, that uh, are uh, w that have been identified as, as um, areas with Phytophthora remorum. And then they issue uh, landowners with a notice to fell the, the larch trees in, in those areas. And this may seem a bit radical, but um, it's like a fire break. The, the, the trees need to be taken down so as to reduce the ability to spread. Um, now the phytophthora, the, the spores don't spread very far, very quickly. So they need wind blown rain to spread and that they can hop about kind of 10, 10 kilometers maximum or less. And then they take hold of another area. So the, the more breaks you can put in terms of the species that the, that the phytophthora can colonize, um, then the better that'll slow, slow down its, its progression. The other way that, um, that the phytophthora and, and other uh, pest and pathogen species are being managed is is by observing and, and monitoring them. And um, there's one really great app called Observatory, um, which any anyone can download, and it, it it trains people to identify different tree pests and pathogens, including Phytophthora remorum, and it provides a route for anyone to notify local tree health authorities of, of potential risks. And so this enables the authorities to manage outbreaks more quickly and easily. I presume that monoculture makes the, this type of pathogen far more prolific. So creating more diversity within a forest or a woodland is another sort of plant-based solution, really nature-based solution. Yes, absolutely. Like, like most pests and pathogens, um, they have preferred host species that, that, that they like to, to live on and, and, um, and eventually um, either kill or, or severely damage. Um, so if you have a mix of different species, some resilient to certain pests and others not, then your, your whole system is going to be more resilient to, to outbreaks. Um, so you don't, get, you, you don't get a whole area wiped out from one, one pest or pathogen outbreak. I presume there are future concerns as well with the way our climate is trending. Yes, yes. So we're certainly seeing warming climate and many pests and pathogens thrive in a, in a warmer climate in, in, our, in our conditions. Um, so those pests and pathogens are able to survive particularly over the winter and overwintering species are able to build up their populations and spread more quickly um, than if they're wiped out during the winter. Um, so also ex more extreme events, if we have more extreme rainfall events, then certain pathogens like Phytophthora remorum are likely to, to really 
uh, find that favourable, particularly for, for spread and um, population growth. So uh, I think future climate is, is looking favourable for many pests and pathogens. And, and also there's a lot of, lot of pests and pathogens that are, are not that far from our shores and, and able to, to survive in the UK under our current climate. And so those are likely to take a hold and spread in the future. Okay. And finally, um, any hope for our, our larch here in the UK? I, I hope so. I mean, our ecosystems are very resilient um, in general. There are lots of uh, ways in which species can come back from being wiped out. Um, they can develop new strains and, um, and build a new resilient uh, variety. Um, but we may well it may well take a long time. And um, fortunately, our, our larch is, is struggling at the moment, a bit like elm and, and ash have done in the past. Dr. Debbie Hemming there talking to Claire Nazir. Nigel, how do the Wildlife Trust feel about the potential impacts of climate change in the future years? Like everyone else, it could be really quite scary. Um, can't deny that. Um, but we're generally an optimistic bunch. I think that there's nothing about wildlife trusts if it's not optimistic and practical. So I think our view on it is that we need to keep it as limited as possible. So we're very committed to reducing our carbon emissions and, and, and so on. Um, and we're putting a lot of effort into that. Um, we're also um, thinking that, well, whatever comes in future for the natural world it's going to be very different to what it is now and so we need to be putting a lot more effort into um, doing the things that we know we can do but on a bigger scale you know um, making our landscapes more natural making them more flood resilient making our towns and cities more green so they can uh, maintain a, a constant temperature in hot summers and uh, and so on there's all sorts of stuff we can do we know how to do a lot of it and so we're you know, quite up for the challenge of both keeping climate changes under control as we can keep it and also making sure that this country adapts as it needs to to, to whatever the future climate ends up being. Yeah, it's important to stay optimistic and, and, and everyone can, can play their part. How, how can people at home, people watching this, um, help? Well, of course, the number one thing they can do is join the local wildlife trust. Um, we put a lot of effort in. There's all sorts of things you can do in your local area, you know. I mean, um, don't use pes pesticides in your garden. Um, be careful about how you use water. Um, make sure your politicians know what you think about these things because you know, there isn't a single area of anyone's life that is going to be made um, better, easier, cheaper in future if climate change goes through the worst scenarios that are possible and equally there's nothing that's going to be made um, worse by doing something about it and a heck of a lot of things that will be made better if we put the effort in and, and, and look after the wildlife, the natural world and it will do its job in helping to look after us. Nigel Dorr from the Wildlife Trust, thank you so much for joining us for this episode of Climate Conversations. Thank you very much for watching. We will, of course, be back next month. In November, we're going to be talking about mitigation in particular. So join us then. But for now, it's goodbye.